Good morning. I'm so grateful that you are worshiping with us this morning. I just want to highlight um, one of our announcements, and that is that uh, this evening at 7 p.m., our weekly backyard gathering is going to be at the home of Rudy and Lee Fast, and their home directions are in the insert in the bulletin. Let's continue to worship through scripture and song. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young and a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, 
till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on your shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good, you are merciful, and you are loving, and you fight battles that we can never, we can never face and never win without you. And Lord, I just ask uh, that as we move into this, deeper into this time of worship, that our hearts would be opened, our, our minds be clear, and that we are prepared for the message that you have for us today. And I just pray that uh, for all those who are hurting, those mental hurts, spiritual hurts, physical and emotional hurts, Lord, I just pray that your, your peace be with them, your peace that surpasses all understanding, uh, be with them and comfort those who need it most, Lord, and that they can see your love and your mercy and your generous, gracious heart washing over them and that you be glorified and praised in this place, Lord. 
And I just pray that as we come deeper into our message, Lord, that into the message that you have for us, that that we confess our sins and ask for your forgiveness as you forgive those, as we forgive those who trespass against us and that you be glorified and that we repent of our sins and that we come to a place of understanding that we are lost without you and that we need you and that we love you. And finally, Lord, I just pray that as we, as I share this message, that uh, the words that come from my mouth meditations of my heart this past week be not mine but they are yours and they glorify and please you and they edify this church as we go out into the world and share your name with those around us in the holy name of your son Jesus we pray amen so this past August long weekend I got to go camping with a group of friends and during our time together, I actually got to chatting with one of our friends, and uh, we got onto the topic of preaching. And I just casually mentioned that, you know, I was going to be preaching this week, but back then it was just like, in this August, I'm going to be preaching. And she asked me what I was preaching on, and so then I let her know that I'm going to be preaching on Ephesians 10, or no, sorry, that doesn't exist, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. And then she got really excited. Uh, she let me know that... Um, Throughout her time of life, living, she at one point decided that she loves that. Well, she didn't decide. She loves these verses and then decided that she was going to get a tattoo of the words in the passage with the associated body part that it talks about uh, to remind her what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to be a soldier of Christ. And my hope in this sermon is that you all feel as excited about this topic as she was. Uh, that because, because being excited about scripture and looking for ways to remind yourself about scripture is a joy that is fine to be unparalleled. Finding joy in scripture, even in the hard parts of scripture, really shows our outward expression of that inward love that we feel that Jesus expressed for us when he hung on the cross. So I am going to read Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, which reads, I'm reading from the ESV. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in, strength of, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, as we dive into this passage, we find that Paul is calling the Ephesians to finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, why is that finally there? I think it is to highlight an end cap to an argument that Paul has been laying out for the last two chapters of the letter in, to the Ephesians. He started the argument that the Ephesians must therefore be imitators of Christ as beloved children and that they must walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself 
himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This claim is then followed up but with examples of how we should be how we should be imitators of Christ. Paul discusses the sins that we should be avoiding. Uh, he discusses that Christians should not walk as unwise, but as wise. And then he gets into specifics of how wives, husbands, children, uh, and bond servants uh, can be imitators of Christ in their actions and in their roles. Paul brings this claim to a conclusion by stating that finally we can be imitators of Christ by being strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. What is one way we can do that? Well, Paul lays it out for us, that we can be strong in the Lord by putting on the full armor of God. The purpose of putting this armor on is so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Paul states that we must put on the full armor of God because our battle is not of flesh and blood. It is not a battle against each other. It is a spiritual battle. And it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now when it comes to the spiritual realm, uh, there seems to be two more prominent stances that are common among Christians. Um, not, to mention, not to say that there isn't, these are the only two, but these can tend to be the most prominent two. There is the stance that the spiritual realm outside of God and angels does not exist. That demons and devils aren't a thing. And then there is the stance that everything worldly and secular is a demon or a devil trying to kill you or take you away from God. Now, to be fair, both of these stances have an inkling of merit, but I believe that there is a middle path that is the more wise path here. Uh, I think we can say without a doubt that uh, we live in a world where there is a cosmic battle raging. And that battle is vying for the lives of humans. But also that sometimes things like having your window broken is not a demon trying to get you down or discourage you and is actually just a broken window because some kids were playing baseball and one kid had a really great home run. There are not demons living under every rock. But there may be under some. So we must adorn we must adorn these warfare armaments because we do not know where the next attack is coming from. Because when spiritual warfare does come, you'll be able to stand your ground, not run from the fight, but take your strength in Christ in the might of the Lord. Now that we are standing in the strength of the Lord, let us take a look at the armor that we are wearing. The first thing that Paul mentions is that we are wearing a belt of truth. Truth is the most important piece because without truth, everything else is meaningless. N.T. Wright tells us that the primary thing about Christian, the Christian message is that it is true. If it isn't, it's meaningless. It isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. Never give up on the sheer truth of the gospel. It's like a belt which holds everything together and in place. Now, we understand belts to just like, yeah, hold up our pants. But in the ancient Near East and back then, they had belts for another reason for soldiers. And they were used for it's called girding up your loins where you take that extra cloth that's hanging around your legs and you kind of essentially make like a little diaper out of it. But then it gives you more mobility, more movement, and it keeps, you, it keeps everything in its place so that you are more battle ready. The second aspect of the armor of God is that the breastplate of righteousness. This piece of armor that protects our most vital organs is righteousness. It is something that we cannot attain ourselves. Righteousness is bestowed upon the disciples and 
and it brings his people into right standing with him, with God. I cannot attain righteousness for myself. You cannot attain righteousness for yourself. But righteousness is given by God through the redemption of Jesus Christ. This gift is protecting the vitals, and it is our line of defense against certain death. And as we move down the armor, we come to the sandals of peace. These sandals hold us steadfast in Christ's peace. As I pray, often I will pray for the peace that surpasses all understanding, which is a verse found in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which reads, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We can be rooted in Christ, in his peace, and we stand ready with the gospel message. That one, it is true. The gospel message is true. And two, the gospel message can bring us to understand the righteousness of God, the redemption of Jesus Notice that these three pieces of armor, the belt, the breastplate, and the shoes, so far have been working in a defensive uh, scenario. We have yet to come across a piece of armor that leads us to the offensive. We will get there soon, but as of right now, as soldiers, we are only on the defensive. We then dress ourselves with the shield of faith which can extinguish all the flaming darts of the enemy. Now, some may be asking what those flaming darts are. And I think that, yes, that is a good question. I don't think that that's the main point of this verse, however. It really, if you think, if you really think about it, it doesn't matter what the flaming darts are. It just matters that we get behind the shield of faith and hide from those flaming darts because we can hide behind our faith in Jesus, our loyalty to him, and any darts that come our way will not be strong enough to take us out. So our faith protects us from direct attack from the enemy. There may be an onslaught or it may just be one or two darts, but as long as we hide behind that shield of faith, we are safe in the arms of Jesus. Then our final two pieces of armor are the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation is vital because salvation is rooted in Christ. When we wear the helmet, we remember, as N.T. Wright says, that you already belong to the family of the risen Messiah and that you have therefore already been rescued from the ultimate enemy, enabling you to face all secondary enemies. Knowing our salvation gives us peace to face the enemy because we know that we have already won. And finally, Paul leaves uh, an important piece for last. He leaves the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Which if you've been tracking, so far is the only piece of armor that the disciples of Jesus possess that is not strictly defensive. This has offensive capabilities. Uh, When God's people can wield the word of God, they are able to fight back sin and temptation as they come. We can also wield the word of God to fight back the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and the spiritual forces of the evil of evil in the heavenly realms. God's justice, justice, God's justice and righteousness come through his word, and his disciples are given this opportunity to wield the word of God. Now we must wield this word responsibly 
and that in taking up the word of God, we are marching with Yahweh, with his name imprinted on us, and that we must not be wielding God's name in vain. We must bear the name of God, the word of God, responsibly and reflect the glory and beauty of Jesus to the world around us. And we are to be his lips, his hands, and his feet on earth. In the Gospel of John, Jesus states that his disciples are known by their love for one another. So, perhaps before condemning someone, think about, think about that. Jesus' disciples are marked as the ones who love one another, not striking down everything that is a slight to God. God doesn't need us to fight his battle. He is God. He is the one true God. But when we walk with his name on us, Yahweh, when printed on us and take his name in vain, through not reflecting his character, that's the point. When we take his name, we are taking his name in vain. When we do not reflect his character, we begin to move into a place of this battle that we do not belong in. And then we begin sinning. So how can we fight this battle? Well, Paul states that the most practical way for us to go about this fight is through prayer. He instructs us to pray in the Spirit. Where pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that the words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Prayer is the easiest and the hardest thing for a disciple of Jesus to master, if we can ever master prayer. It requires diligence, it requires focus, and it requires desire. But it also can be performed in the most menial service tasks. It can happen as you pass someone on the street. It can happen in an instant, and it can happen over years of continuous prayer. Paul instructs the Ephesians to pray for the saints, to pray on behalf of those who need it with resolute perseverance. Now, I feel like there are many words that I could say that reveal what prayer is like, what prayer, is, prayer in the Spirit is like. But I think that Richard Foster has expressed that so beautifully. So I'm going to end off by reading a passage from his book entitled uh, Prayer. Now, if any of you would like a primer on the topic of prayer, I think this is a really good book. Uh, It's super accessible, great read, uh, but covers a lot of great topics surrounding prayer, and I think you would benefit. So I'm going to read this passage now. For too long we have been in a far country, a country of noise and hurry and crowds, a country of climb and push and shove, a country of frustration and fear and intimidation. And he welcomes us home, home to serenity and peace and joy, home to friendship and fellowship and openness, home to intimacy and acceptance and affirmation. We do not need to be shy. He invites us in the living room of his heart, where we can put on old slippers and share freely. He invites us into the kitchen of his friendship, where chatter and batter mix in good fun. He invites us into the dining room of his strength, where we can feast to our heart's delight. He invites us into the study of his wisdom, where we can learn and grow and stretch and and ask all the questions we want. He invites us into the workshop of his creativity, where we can be co-laborers with him, working together to determine the outcomes of events. He invites us into the bedroom of his rest, where new peace is found and where we can be naked and vulnerable and free. It is also the place of deepest intimacy, 
where we know and are known to the fullest. The key to this home, this heart of God, is prayer. Perhaps you have never prayed before except in anguish or terror. It may be that the only time the divine name has ever come across your lips has been in angry explicitives. Never mind, I am here to tell you that the Father's heart is open wide. You are welcome to come in. Perhaps you do not believe in prayer. You may have tried to pray and were profoundly disappointed and disillusioned. You seem to have a little faith or none. It does not matter. The Father's heart is open wide. You are welcome to come in. Perhaps you are bruised and broken by the pressures of life. Others have wronged you and you feel scarred for life. You have old pain, you have old painful memories that have never been healed. You avoid prayer because you feel too distant, too unworthy, too defiled. Do not despair. The Father's heart is open wide. You are welcome to come in. Perhaps you have prayed for many years, but the words have grown brittle and cold. Little ever happens anymore. God seems remote and inaccessible. Listen to me. The Father's heart is open wide. You are welcome to come in. Perhaps prayer is the delight of your life. You have lived in the divine milieu for a long time and can attest to its goodness. But you long for more, more power, more love, more of God in your life. Believe me, the Father's heart is open wide. You too are welcome to come higher up and deeper in. If the key is prayer, the door is Jesus Christ. How good of God to provide us a way into his heart. He knows we are stiff-necked and hard-hearted, so he provided a means of entrance. Jesus the Christ lived the perfect life, died in our place, and rose victorious over all the dark powers so that we might live through him. This is wonderfully good news. No longer do we have to stand outside, barred from the nearness of God by our rebellion. We may now enter through the door of God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Amen.
And now for the benediction, the good word. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.